This is a philosophy reflection, which is actually a follow-up to my most recent one, which had to do with the revelations about Facebook and their experiments with emotional contagion. If you remember, the news broke, oh, it's about a month ago, that Facebook had carried out a study in which some users, a very, very small percentage of users, were experimented on without getting informed consent from them. And the way that the experiment ran was in half of the people's feeds, they were given more negative information coming in. Uh, that is, Facebook had used some sort of decision procedure to figure out what counted as negative, what counted as positive posts. And they muted the positive posts so that the people would be getting a, a bigger dose of negativity, you could say. And then for the other half of the, the well, there were actual control groups as well. Uh, for the other experimentees, what they did is they gave them a higher dose of positive posts, in some cases muting all the negative posts, and then they watched to see what these people in their turn would post. Would they post more positive posts on their own part, more negative posts? Would they be unaffected by it entirely? And so what Facebook found out was they were affected by it, but it was pretty marginal. They carried this out over a week. What was interesting was how strong the reaction, the emotional reaction, to the revelations of this were. And I wanted to think a bit about, um, are these on track, are they off track? And since I have this great location to shoot in, I thought that, you know, we've got the speaker Death Star here, uh, exemplifying technology in a high-tech incubator. I would follow up and, and begin talking about some of these uh, Facebook revelations and discuss in detail three main things that, that I had left as interesting points to follow up. The question about the IRB or ethics board, um, the issue of why are we so upset about this, and then um, one of the other questions, which is, um, is this research itself well-founded. Can we, in fact, do research of this sort about emotions just using tag phrases or algorithms focused on vocabulary? So let's talk first about the very ideas behind this kind of study. There's a lot of research that has been going on for quite some time into thinking about how we could uh, understand and manipulate and modify and provoke and dampen people's emotions. Uh, this is not something new. Aristotle actually discusses the importance of this for the speaker in his Art of Rhetoric. And he faults the previous rhetoricians, the technologoi, interestingly enough, for having given attention only to provoking and, and dampening emotional responses and not paying attention to the the deeper dimensions of human being, of logos, and we call them ethos, um, that could produce greater persuasion. But he also had great attention to how the emotions themselves work. He made some great contributions, for example, to our understanding of how anger works. Um, now, let's fast forward to the present, where Facebook is attempting to try to categorize people's posts as either negative or positive. So let's think about this for a moment. Negative and positive emotions, is that too broad of a conception to successfully apply? Um, where are the dividing lines? There are different ways of deciding what counts as a negative emotion, what counts as a positive emotion. There are some that are very easy to place in that, that um, category, you know, fear, anger, those are viewed as, as negative, anxiety. Um, it's not just emotion, though, that they were looking for, words that would somehow signify those things. It's any sort of negatively valorized thing, bad, uh, some sort of complaint would be a negative word. Then on the other hand, you have you know the whole realm of the positive, and that's a little loosey-goosey as well. That's just as hard to get a handle on and say exactly where the dividing lines are, exactly what it consists in. So, you know, of course, words like happy, glad, joyful, blissful, those would be easy to do. But how do you, in fact, parse out the things that fall into the great borderline categories? That's one problem. Another major problem with this kind of research, if they're going to take 
natural human language, and then they're going to analyze large swaths of it. Facebook isn't the only people trying to do this. You know, there are market people trying to do this so that they can predict market uh, trends. The, the military is very interested in this sort of thing. So are a lot of other uh, institutions as well. The problem is human language by itself is not so simple as just a bunch of input outputs. It's self-referential. We can use it in ironic ways and sarcastic ways. We can be quoting somebody. If I um, replicate somebody else's post in Facebook, you know, that doesn't happen quite so often, but think about Twitter and retweeting somebody else's thing. The same thing happens in Google Plus. Somebody shares something, you can share their sharing of it. You can have these nested things. Am I endorsing? Am I taking on? Am I expressing, re-expressing their positive or negatively valorized emotional state? It's a good question, an open question, one that really ought to be put to those who claim any sort of scientific basis for, for this research. What they can be scientific about, what they can easily make claims about, would be things like, you know, how often these words, these types of words emerge. The problem is, is that we're dealing with questions of meaning. And when it comes to words and meaning, we're dealing with uh, much more than, than merely what the word unit itself signifies in most conditions. You know, Facebook is used for very personal exchanges between people and what appears to be a positively valorized word by the methodology that they're using in this may in fact be a negatively valorized word or vice versa. There may be a lot of words that are positively or negatively valorized but are considered as neutral because the researchers aren't able to penetrate into that. So all of that said, what, what that goes to, to show us is that we really ought to be very skeptical about the claims made by this sort of research. Um, what's interesting, the research doesn't have to actually be on track, viable, significantly predictive, revelatory of the human condition in order for it to be actionable. And I think that the real danger of this sort of stuff is not that people are actually going to be able to predict what it is that I think or you know, what I'm going to reproduce in Facebook. It's rather that they're going to think that they are and then they're going to make decisions based on those projections. So that itself throws more things into the mix. In many cases, it's not simply control. It's the illusion of control that produces control. A second important topic that I've been thinking a bit about after this, this Facebook uh, flap and after doing the first Philosophy Geek video on that is this question of having an IRB or an ethics board. Now, Facebook is not going to have an, an IRB uh, in part because they're not an educational institution, and IRBs generally are set up by those, an institutional review board, anything, any research that has to do with human subjects where, you know, there are certain standards ought to apply, like informed consent. If you're going to do a study like that, then you have to put it through an institutional review board. And they will give it a yes or no, we'll say modify it, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. Um, much of academic publishing requires, you know, if they think that you're possibly going to need an IRB, they want to see your IRB. So that's the academic world. And, you know, hinky things go on even with that. Now we get to the corporate world. And one of the reasons why the Facebook study people didn't seek out an IRB is they said, well, we don't need it, you know. Facebook gathered the information, Facebook did the experiment. We university researchers merely took the data that they generated and then, you know, wrote an article on it. And people said, no, nah, that you're all in the same bed together. Really, you should have done an IRB for that. Now, companies like Facebook would not have an institutional review board. Instead, what they would have is something like an ethics board. And it would perform a lot of the same functions, except it would have a broader purview and it could extend to a lot of other areas. And this is one, you know, this is going to be a digression. This is one area in modern, uh, late capitalism life 
where things have really gone off the tracks. You know, we have we have outsourced our, our thinking about moral and ethical topics and our moral and ethical reasoning to departments like HR, who are not actually, in many cases, equipped to deal with that. Um, we've unfortunately allowed many of the experts, the people who do a lot of work in that, to be marginalized over here on the side. Many of them marginalize themselves. And we put it in the hands of people who are not going to be particularly good at seeing these things through, or whose, whose own interests are going to steer them to give the sort of answers that the corporation or the researchers or whoever it is that we ought to be protected from is going to want, and not the answers that those who these, these standards are supposed to be protecting. Think about informed consent. If we just stick with that, an ethics board would have looked at this Facebook experiment and then said, look, you need to get informed consent. That's a good thing to do. That uh, applies here. You're probably violating some people's rights. Um, certainly going against some, some moral principles by doing this. Get some informed consent. But that didn't happen. So maybe Facebook should create an ethics review board. And that sounds good on the surface. I can see a few issues that could arise with that. And I've written these down for, for your reflection and perhaps you know, spark some conversation. Um, I think that one of the big risks is of putting together a board that looks very good on paper, but is in actuality just a bunch of rubber stampers. Uh, if you're going to pick people that are already, you know, in prestigious corporate situations where they do blah 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 about ethics, and that is they talk the language, that does not guarantee for you that they actually are going to follow through when, when things start to get sticky. And, and ethics is always about when things get sticky, when different interests are at play. There's never easy you know, ethical problems that come up in front of you because those are the no-brainers. It's the, it's the tricky ones. So you know, the danger is that you know, whoever they put in place might not actually provide any, any real scrutiny, any real oversight, any real follow-up they would probably have incentives not to do so. And it's, it's, it, I'm not saying that this couldn't be done, but there would have to be a lot of thought put into how do you create an independent board within the corporate structure um, that's looking out not just for the good of the shareholders, not just the good of the company itself and its corporate you know, structure, corporate culture, but the good of all of the other stakeholders. That's a, that's, that takes a lot of work. Um, another issue is that a lot of these companies will say things like, well, you know, we have these kinds of things in place. We, we do training in, in ethics, you know, through HR, or, you know, we have an ethics board. Unless you're actually making that public, and you're making it public in a way that's accessible to the average Joe, who does, who's probably using your service and doesn't have to do an awful lot of work to get themselves the information about what they could in fact be subjected to, you're not being transparent. Their transparency is one of those slippery words that gets used a lot as a buzzword, but there really is something important about the notion of transparency, which is closely related to accountability. You cannot have full accountability without transparency, because without that, the people who most need the information can't find the information and say, hey, I'm crying foul. So would the ethics board, its deliberations, would that actually be transparent? Would it be publicized, for instance? Um, would there be discussions ahead of time? Hey, this issue is going to come up. Does the public want to weigh in? If Google, if Facebook actually lived up to the sort of rhetoric that they put out there, they would want to do that sort of thing. But you notice that they're not doing it, so that should, that should give you pause. Another issue that I think could come up in terms of the, the ethics board um, review, you have to be very careful when you're dealing with moral issues not to just allow yourself to get bogged down in technicalities and use having technicalities as an excuse to push things that you know are wrong 
off to the side as, well, there's really nothing we can do about it. And when it comes to data collection, I think that this is particularly important. In this, this particular instance, the researcher said we didn't need an IRB approval because Facebook gathered that information and we were just using it. Now imagine the reversal. There could be data that is ethically collected, you know, that is where it's being collected in some sort of situation where some ethics board has said, yeah, this is okay. This, this makes sense. Could that data then be used for unethical purposes? If you had a real robust review process, I think that those sorts of considerations about what this data might be used for, not what it's just going to be used for in this situation, but what it might be used for, uh, would have to be part of the deliberative process and going into saying yes, no, or revise and resubmit. So the, the institutional review board slash ethics board issue is not as cut and dry as people want it to be. Those are some reflections that you can you know, consider and uh, perhaps continue in a, another conversation. The third big issue that I really want to revisit is a messier one. It's not quite so kind of dry as were, were these studies actually measuring anything real or you know, what about having an IRB? It's more the open question uh, how should we be looking at these, these big data slash social media slash technology companies, um, both you know, in terms of looking at them and in terms of looking at our own responsibilities and our own, um, our own attitudes as consumers. Why were people so upset to find out that Facebook essentially did an experiment that was poorly designed, had some premises and some methodology that didn't really, well, they're, they're quite shaky, and then had a very marginal result, and it worked on a very small amount of the people involved for one week. Why was this so upsetting? Well, because people think that there's, you know, things that these, these companies ought to be doing and other things that they, they think they ought not to be doing. Um, you know, a lot of people talked in terms of privacy. I think that privacy is a bit of a misnomer. It, it bothered people that emotions were being manipulated. Why is that so bothersome when we live in an environment where our emotions are being provoked and, and manipulated all of the time through advertising? Which Facebook does, which Google does, you know, which Twitter does. Um, why is this one thing considered to be so egregious? Well, it, it, partly because we think of our emotions as our own, as if, if there's nothing else that we get to have, it's, it's our emotional states and our thoughts. And if those are subject to manipulation in experiments, not just in you know, advertising trying to get us to do something, we know that those advertisers are trying to get us to do something, but those researchers, those social networks, they shouldn't be messing with us like that. I think that a lot of people have that, that sort of point of view, and it's worth thinking about. I'm not going to say that they're right, I'm not going to say that they're wrong at this point, but I think that it's worth thinking of further about. Um, I have a few reflections on this. One is that, you know, there's a lack of realism on the part of many people who use social media and who don't think very much about the medium. And this is natural. We often don't think about you know, what the, the constraints, what the incentives, disincentives, um, what the supply chain, all those things are for media. And it could be a media like a legal pad and writing. It could be the, the printed press. It could be the newspaper. It could be Facebook, social media. Um, until something emerges, people tend to treat it uh, for the most part is, well, it's just there, we just use it, it's a neutral medium, it's innocuous, it doesn't really do anything. Maybe it's a bit of a time waster and distractor, but that's because I have poor impulse control or time management skills. It's not a, a social problem. And then something like this comes on the scene, and people start going crazy. 
in their reactions. The reactions are very extreme compared to what actually went on. They say, I can't believe they're doing that. I'm going to get off of Facebook. Um, somebody should do something. There ought to be a law. You know, the government ought to, ought to come in and, and take charge of this. It was a huge mistake, you know, if that were to be the case. What I think that this points us towards is the need for, and I'm not sure how to do this. This is a subject for much larger conversation. The need to create an educated, savvy populace of consumers when it comes to this sort of stuff. That doesn't mean cynics who are going to say, well, whatever they want to do is okay. I just have to suck it up. It's the, the price of doing business, whether you know commerce or engaging in friendship, emotional postings with my, my networks. We don't want that. We do want people to have a sense of proportion about this, and we want people to, to realize that the media that we're talking about and these big companies are not innocuous, they're not innocent, they're not you know, always going to be on the up and up until proven wrong. You really ought to, to, to think about this. Um, we need to provide people not just with information, but with the skills needed to, to process, to make sense of that information about what these companies are doing so they can make better informed choices, uh, not only at the level of whether they participate or not, but how they post, whether they, you know, to uh, continue with that or, or not. Um, I think another thing that's a different reflection is that these tech companies, by their very nature, are, are a dangerous thing in terms of information and ideology. Because on the one hand, they tend to be part of this, well, we're changing the world for the better. I mean, that, that show Silicon Valley, it's kind of a parody, but that rhetoric that these people have, making the world a better place, these companies do in fact espouse that. Google does in fact think that don't be evil is a significant moral principle, contentless. But, you know, they sort of feel, well, we're the people that, that are, you know, changing things for the better. We're the, if we're going to put this in the 18th century terms, we're the enlightened ones. We can be trusted. If there's anything that history has taught us, it's that every time that somebody sets themselves up like that, they're not to be trusted. And their limits that they place on themselves are not the limits that we would want them to have in there's nothing really keeping these great big tech companies, and by this I mean Apple, Microsoft, Google, um, uh, Yahoo if they ever get their act together, um, Facebook, Amazon, you know, they are, they are by their very nature trying to extend themselves into every nook and cranny. They have almost totalitarian uh, I might say just totalizing designs on, on things in, in the form of a sort of a soft despotism, not a governmental one, but a corporate one. And this is just part of the environment that we're in. We should not, and I'm not saying this to get them off the hook, but we should not be so stupid as to expect that they will self-impose the kind of limits that we ordinary people would like to see on them. Um, on, on the other hand, um, we shouldn't buy into this sort of illusion of you know, everything is happy and nice until something goes bad. So there's two sides to this. You know, the, 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 the corporations themselves, the big tech corporations, they're not going to rein themselves in. They're going to do this sort of stuff. And we don't want to like, you know, say that the sky is falling every time, like, every time something like that happens. We do need to be savvy consumers. And I think that I'm not a great optimist about this, but the more people that we can get to be not enlightened, but informed and to have the skills to process information, the better these sorts of big companies can be held in check. Um, they are massive market forces, and there is very little that the one person can do against them. It will take communities of people you know, crying foul and saying, this, this sort of stuff shouldn't fly. Um, so those are my reflections. We've talked about three different things, and um, there's a lot more to be said about this, I'm sure, but that's where this technosphere reflections are going to end.